-hmm. One of the reasons that I've been opposing the collectivist thought that's characteristic of the insistence that group identity is the primary phenomenon, say socially and cognitive, morally, more importantly, mm -hmm. is that it's the wrong uniting principle. The right uniting principle is the divinity of the individual, to speak in religious terms. And we can strip that of its religious significance and say, mm -hmm. well, part of it is that the proper level of analysis for political discourse is, the is predicated on the sanctity of the individual. Mm -hmm. And so we need to get serious as a culture about whether or not we actually believe this and, and, and what the relationship between that belief and reality actually is. So Ooh, that's hard. Because, as you know, you're far ahead of this, um, far ahead of me on this. It's hard to be an individual. It's not natural. It's not. I don't think it's what we're hardwired for. It's a rather new concept. And yeah. many people spontaneously will say they want to be an individual. I think to an extent, though, that's fashion. And uh -huh. to most people, group identity is what gives them a sense of purpose. And yes. that's the way human beings have always been. And it's hard to really make a person realize being an individual means that it's really just you. For example, many very smart black people, I think, are under the impression that being an individual means that you have the bravery to stick your fist up and battle racist attitudes. But the problem is that is now a group activity. That's something that lots and lots of other people are doing. It only may seem a little bit unusual to a very naive white person looking on or subject to it. And so the question is, how do you really feel about these things? If you want to battle racism, how would you like to do it as opposed to adopting certain mantras and battle cries? But mantras and battle cries are what we human beings do. We do it together. That's hard. That's a, that's a tough thing because individualism might not be the way that humanity needs to go. I personally would prefer it. That's my my sense. Mm -hmm. And that's your sense, I think. But I think a very coherent case could be made that that particular conception of marching to the beat of your own drummer is an eccentricity that certain solitary minded people came to cherish amidst industrialization over a certain two or 300 years. I don't know if I could re refute that. Okay, so that's okay. So I think that's a, an extremely astute objection, let's say, especially the observation that that and you, you touched on this earlier, that that requirement for group identification is deeply embedded in human con mm -hmm. in human, the substructure of human consciousness. So let's say, well, we want to have friends, we want to have a family, we want to have a town or, or something like that, a community of 200, exactly. right, embedded yeah. in a town. Mm -hmm. I think the question isn't, or the issue isn't so much the fact that it, the idea that the individual is the uniting principle should supplant that it's that that should be organized underneath that in some because mm. it isn't the, it isn't an issue of the absence of the necessity for group identity because without that we couldn't do anything together and wouldn't that be to a extent. catastrophe right yeah right right yeah. and so that has to be recognized and i do think to give the woke types and even if it's a religious manifestation there do if that does produce a sense of cohesive group identity then you can understand the longing for that in a fractionated community that in some sense has got too psychologically large so exactly. that has to be contended with but exactly. i do really see because i viewed the culture wars in the university i really believe they're battling out something extraordinarily deep it's not it, this isn't a surface issue part of the debate and this emerged out of France, the French intellectual tradition fundamentally, as far as I'm concerned, is the question of what level of conception should be primary. And the assault on the patriarchy and on, huh, there's more to it than that, is part of an assault on the idea of, of individuality and and the truth that individuals hold in their language. It's an assault on all of that. It's a deep deep criticism. And I think mm -hmm. it's incredibly dangerous, but I understand why, why it arose. And so definitely. Yeah. And, and, and I was curious about you because you said at the beginning that even though your mother had taught you the, in some sense, these woke precepts, mm -hmm. there was something in you that rebelled against it. Yeah. It's what it's was that? Yeah. It's not, um, I don't rebel against the idea that, for example, there is institutional racism. I don't think it should be called that, mm -hmm. but there are inequities in society between, say, black and white that are due to racist attitudes, usually in the past, and racist 
biases and racist lookings past. All of those things are definitely true. There are all sorts of things in Black history that have helped to set us back that one should certainly know about. One should know about the redlining of neighborhoods where in many cities, most Black people lived in neighborhoods where banks would not give you a loan. All of these things are, are very real. I never felt like I rebelled against that. What I rebelled against was the idea that you base your whole sense of identity upon those things such that you live a life that's abbreviated because you're exaggerating how bad it still is and you're distorting what's necessary to create dignified lives for black people. And my feeling has always been you probably have about 80 years. You know, you're, you're lucky if you've got 80 years and if you spend your whole life maintaining in my time period the same battle poses in the 80s and 90s that people needed in the 50s and 60s. After a while, you've spent your life play acting and then you die and the world goes on. What I rejected was the exaggeration. And so, for example, I remember what really, if there was one moment where I realized there was something wrong with me, it was the in the wake of the Rodney King trial in 1991. And a lot of, a lot of Black people I liked very much were united in saying, what happened to Rodney King shows that a Black man can't get justice in this country. And I remember thinking, no, no, that, that statement would have made sense in about 1965 and in many American cities, 1975. And there were islands of it even in 1991. But the idea that as a 20-something Black person, you were living in a country where you just couldn't get justice, it struck me as beyond rhetoric, especially given the general attitude they had towards what being Black meant then as we were standing around at Stanford University, a campus where all of us had been evaluated according to adjusted standards out of the idea that we were really wanted on that campus, et cetera, that we were supposed to still be speaking that language that the Black Panthers had spoken. It struck me as a pose. And there was a part of me that was deeply disturbed by the artificiality of it and that you were actually expected to live it. it was why, that. The, why are the art of, okay, so you, again, you, you use very specific words, oppose, mm -hmm. artificial, as opposed mm -hmm. to what? Like, what, on what base, like you're comparing it to something. Sure. And it, it sounds, it sounds like you're comparing it. And, and you don't just regard it as an exaggeration. The, your criticism has gone farther than that in the past. I mean, you, you've also, uh, directly stated that conceptualization of the problem in this form is actually interfering with the solutions that we still need to generate. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a, it's not just an exaggeration. It's a problem in and of itself. And that's a deeper criticism. Mm -hmm. So uh, so so what's the artificiality as far as you're concerned and yeah. compared to what? Yeah, what you're um, trying to live, apparently. But what do you what is that exactly? The question is, how much of an obstacle is racism after formal segregation has been battled, after racial attitudes change profoundly in the 1970s? And I'm just old enough to have watched that happen. Just it gets to the point where, OK, racism does exist, both social and institutional. But how much of an obstacle is it to doing pragmatic things that will make poor black people less poor and all black people happier? So quick example would be that these days you can look at the fact that black kids tend not to do as well on standardized tests as, yes, as yes. other kids. It's there. Now, you can look at that and you can say, well, if black kids don't do as well on the test, that's because of racism. And so we need to eliminate the test because the test mm -hmm. is, is racist. Mm -hmm. Now, in what way is the test racist? 40 years ago, maybe those tests asked you what wine goes with chicken. That hasn't been true for generations now. So it's not about asking people things that they have no reason to know. How is it, how is it racist? And there are people today who even will imply that black thought is somehow incompatible with tests like that, which is very close to saying that black people are incapable of disembodied abstract thought. And many whites will it's, chime it's in. It's probably identical with that claim. That. Yeah, it's, it's very unfortunate, mm -hmm. especially given that the people who are saying it know very well the history of that being said about black people. And so you look at the tests and you say that because black kids don't do well on them, they are examples of systemic racism. Well, you have to get rid of racism, so you have to get rid of the tests, which means that you tell America that black kids can't have their abstract reason measured without it being racist. And then when you get somebody saying, well, then black kids just must not be as quick on the uptake, you call them a racist. And in the meantime, it's ignored 
that you consider helping black kids get better at the tests, helping black kids' parents realize what free test prep programs there are in those neighborhoods. The tests just take a little bit of practice, but you're not supposed to talk about it because the tests, quote unquote, are racist. That's a it's an abuse of language and it's abuse of the very conception of what racism is. That's not what my mother raised me in. That's not your grandmother's racism. That's something that comes from a way of thinking that was marginal in 1955, became sexy in about 1966, and here in 2021 is being treated as impregnable wisdom. Someone Black has to speak out against that. So that's what I mean by the exaggeration and the artificiality and the outright harm that comes from these sorts of things.